Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure today to be joined by Daniel Carpenter, Executive Director of Heritage Crafts, and Greta Bertram, who's curator at the Crafts Study Centre in Farnham. Um, and they'll both be helping us show how we can raise awareness of intangible cultural heritage and actively support craft knowledge, skills and practices through our work in rural museums. For those of you who don't know, and I'm sure Daniel and Greta can elaborate on this a little bit if, if we need them to, um, intangible cultural heritage is really about all those non-material aspects of heritage. So we in museums tend to be more familiar with objects and the tangible ends of collections, uh, physical things that we can hold and stick on shelves and number and label. Um, and ICH is about really the 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 less tangible counterpart to that. So that's skills and knowledge and the transmission of knowledge. Um, there's, a, there's a UNESCO convention on intangible cultural heritage, which was uh, pulled together in 2003. Um, the UK still remains one of a handful of countries that aren't signatories to that convention. So this is a, a big issue in, in the intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and and heritage craft skills world um, and we might get onto some of the issues and questions around that but ICH is is considered to be quite broad so UNESCO defines it in terms of five different domains as they as they call it um, and these are oral traditions and expressions so that includes language as a vehicle vehicle of ICH performing arts social practices rituals and festive events knowledge and practices concerning nature in the universe so we might include the environment farming things like that in there as well and traditional craftsmanship so i think as you can see from that kind of description a very top level description of those five domains ich is is of critical relevance to the work that we do in rural museums uh, and i think probably all of us would have aspects of all five of those domains represented within our collections in some way shape or form uh, and probably doubling down particularly on that that agricultural component of, of things concerning nature in the universe, but also on traditional craftsmanship. And uh, Daniel and Greta are really amazing specialists and extremely knowledgeable, particularly in, in relation to that domain and how that relates to ICH. So that's probably the main focus of today's uh, seminar. Um, by way of introduction, some of you may recognize Greta from her time with us here at the Merle. Uh, and since her stint in rural museums, which was which was quite long lived, actually, and we we're great, very lucky to have her with us at the Merrill for so long. She's also gone on to work on cataloging research projects at the University of Hertfordshire, at the Polar Museum at the University of Cambridge. Um, and she has since joined the Craft Study Centre as curator in, 2000, uh, in 2017. Um, she was also a trustee of the Heritage Crafts Association, which has since changed its name to Heritage Crafts. Uh, and that was from two th uh, 2011 through to 2018. Um, and during that time, she conducted a major piece of research into the current state of traditional crafts in the UK, which led to the the first uh, so-called red list of endangered crafts, um, which is an incredibly useful resource. And I'd encourage you all uh, to go and have a look at the Heritage Crafts website and, and dig deeper into the, the endangered list of crafts. Um, so welcome, Greta. Um, and also welcome to Daniel, who I think will probably be familiar to anyone who's worked more closely with uh, Heritage Crafts or the, the artist formerly known as Heritage Crafts Association. Um, Daniel's been working in the arts, crafts and heritage sector for uh, over 16 years. He co-founded Heritage Crafts back in 2009 while leading Voluntary Arts Wales, which is itself now known as Creative Lives. He was then commissioned in 2018 to lead the research on the second edition of the Red List of Endangered Crafts. So this is following on from Greta's work on the first edition. Uh, and this was just before being recruited onto the staff team in 2019, where he's now executive director. And over the past three years, uh, he's ever seen the organization doubling its membership to around 1400 people and has achieved widespread media coverage for its work on craft endangerment. Um, so a warm welcome to you as well, Daniel. Um, I think the, the plan for today is for Daniel to kick off with a, with a presentation around heritage crafts and the work of heritage crafts um, as an organization. And then we'll move over to Greta, who's going to share just a few case studies of museum-based uh, and wider heritage craft and ICH projects that she's worked on uh, over the past few years. And this is looking back even to some of the work that she did with us at the Merrill. Um, so I think without further ado, Daniel, if I could hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen now. I hope that works. 
So do let me know if you can see that. Yes, thumbs up from Ollie. Fantastic. So uh, as Ollie mentioned, I'm the Director of Heritage Crafts. And for those of you who don't know us, we were founded, as Ollie said, as the Heritage Craft Association back in 2009. We set up to support and safeguard traditional craft skills, many of which were at risk of being lost as a result of the lack of funded training routes, the sustained exclusion of creative and haptic learning in schools, and the lack of public appreciation for vernacular culture. We're a non-profit organization. We've been going 13 years, and our aim is to support and safeguard traditional craft skills as part of our shared culture for the benefit of everyone in the UK. We define heritage crafts as any craft practice that requires a high degree of hand skill at the point of production and has been practiced for two or more generations, wherever that skill has originated from in the world. We're very much about the crafts that are in Britain now, not just those that originated here. We're a membership organization, uh, as Ollie mentioned as well, with a membership of around 1400, roughly two thirds of whom are makers and the rest are people who support our aims. Uh, we receive no public funding and are pure, purely funded through our membership, through donations and grants from private trusts and foundations, and increasingly from commercial sponsorship. We've just started a project with the Royal Mint, which is very exciting. Uh, we're also an accredited NGO for UNESCO in the field of intangible cultural heritage. So back in 2012, we lobbied for and were part of a consortium of organizations who worked on a research project called Mapping Heritage Crafts. And Greta was with us at the time and she represented us on some of those panels. Uh, this research showed that the economic contribution of heritage crafts in England was substantial, 4.4 billion pounds gross value added, employing over 210,000 workers. Uh, but despite this size, it showed serious vulnerabilities. And this, this was an aging sector with 80% of practitioners stating that they'd made no plans to pass on their skills to the next generation. Entry routes into the sector for young people had been eroded over generations and a craft career was rarely considered a viable option for school leavers. We realized in the early years of heritage crafts that the UK was straggling far behind the rest of the world in its recognition of intangible cultural heritage. Now one of only 12 of the 193 member states not to have ratified the 2003 UNESCO convention on the safeguarding of ICH. Intangible cultural heritage is an awkward concept for us to convey to the general public for whom heritage is most commonly understood as stately homes, monuments and museum collections. And we do our best to describe it as the heritage that it is embodied in people and is manifest through a performance, whether that be through a song or a dance or a festival, through a belief system or through traditional craft practices. Whereas in the UK, heritage is understood predominantly in terms of the tangible, in most other countries, there is much more parity between the material and living heritage. <laughs> And as a result, a greater recognition of the importance of preserving these aspects of our culture. We continue to advocate for ratification of the convention with government officials and politicians. While the Department for Culture, Media and Sport have shown more interest in discussing the possibility of ratification within the past two years than they have in the previous 10, we've still never been given a firm reason why the UK has been kept out of the convention for so long. It's purely speculation, but it's difficult not to believe that this anomaly has deep roots within our colonial past, as the heritage we do prioritise consists of artefacts gathered from around the world, some in dubious circumstances, the houses of those who profited from the wealth generation of empire, and a society that throughout the 20th century struggled to shake off a class system in which those with social capital and connections took up positions as our cultural gatekeepers. The heritage sector today has moved with the times and is largely a socially progressive force, but its infrastructure is still very much that of the 19th century. The knowledge, skills and practices of working communities have been included in the heritage sector, as demonstrated to some extent by the wonderful museums such as Weald and Downland, St Fagans, Black Country Living Museum and the Museum of English Rural Life, of course, to name a few. But these museums often find themselves swimming against the stream of the prevailing paradigm and funding structures focused on buildings rather than practices, a paradigm that Laura Jane Smith has labelled the authorised heritage discourse. 
As a result of the existential threats facing heritage crafts, in 2017, uh, Greta helped us publish the first edition of the Red List of Endangered Crafts, which has now become our flagship project, attracting the attention of media and general public like never before. The Red List is the first research of its kind in the UK to rank craft skills by the likelihood that they'll survive into the next generation using ICH safeguarding principles. The Red List uses a combination of qualitative and quantitative measures, looking at the number of practitioners, the number of trainees, the momentum of change, and any particular existential threats the crafts are facing. The issues affecting craft viability are many and varied, and each craft has its unique issues it's dealing with. However, we have been able to identify some commonalities across the Red List as a whole. First common issue we have identified, and there's nothing particularly original in that, is that of education and training. Young people are emerging from school with relatively little experience of craft activities, and even less of a sense that craft can be a viable career with youngsters that show any inclination for crafts being funneled into a narrow band of subjects that aren't necessarily that hands-on. Beyond school, there is a lack of training options with only around a quarter of the crafts we cover having apprenticeship standards to allow trainers to access government funds to pay their apprentices. Other issues include those listed on screen, but all of them interact with each other and with a common story being, being that craftspeople are so busy servicing their niche market that they are unable to take time away from production to train someone for fear that this market will evaporate in the meantime, plus the financial burden of taking someone on when there is no way of drawing down government funding to help them. The third edition of the Red List was published in 2021, which we assessed 244 crafts, 56 of which were deemed critically endangered, meaning that while there is meaning that they're at serious risk of no longer being practiced. A further 74 were listed as endangered, meaning that they currently have sufficient practitioners to transmit the skills to the next generation, but that there are still serious concerns about their ongoing viability. We're currently working on the fourth edition due to be published on May the 11th. Uh, the new edition will introduce, introduce a new classification with crafts able to be added to the, to the list by virtue not only of their skills, but also of their cultural context, meaning significant crafts such as Scottish Shandu making and fairground sign writing can be included for the first time. Prior to this, we were unable to include crafts that practiced and that were practiced endemically throughout the country, but had a core of practice within the community of geography, culture or religion, uh, and that was culturally significant in its own right and under threat. The new methodology allows us to embed our work into ICH discussions even further by linking with other domains such as festivals and religious practices by recognizing the geographically rooted nature of some of the craft practices and the specificity of crafts practiced by cultural groups. So what does all this mean for museums? Well, traditional craftsmanship is perhaps the most difficult of the five domains of ICH to incorporate into museum provision. Uh, so why, why might that be the case? Unlike religious practices or artistic performances, which can be written down and recorded, sometimes with the written word and sometimes with a dedicated system of notation, craft skills resist recording in this way. We talk a lot about tacit skills, embodied knowledge and the difficulty, if not impossibility, of articulating this knowledge through language. I still feel that work needs to be done to interrogate this understanding to ascertain whether it is in fact the case that this knowledge can't be articulated or simply we don't yet have the language sophisticated enough to do so. But as things stand, the tone of a mallet driving a felly into a cartwheel, the haptic feedback of vibrations of a saw cut back through highly attuned fingers, and the precise rose orange shoe of iron ready to be worked are unable to be captured in this way. A museum is, at its heart, a repository. It can store liturgies and dance notations as easily as it can store pottery and silverware. It can understand the importance of embodied performance in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage and bring in dance groups or festival performers whenever it likes to demonstrate their respective ICH domains, safe in the knowledge that they have it protected. Craftsmanship, if it exists only in the continued embodied performance of its practitioners, is a one-to-one -one transmission from master to apprentice and is a whole other anxiety-filled prospect for the museum. 
The Eco Museum Ideal, exemplified in Skansen in Stockholm and to a limited extent at St Fagans, the Black Country Living Museum, Iron Bridge, Beamish and others, is one option to have craftspeople permanently working on site and ideally passing their skills on. But too often this is performed as a historical reconstruction frozen in the past, an anachronism used to contextualize a heritage building or landscape as much as to safeguard the craft skills. Crafts have survived to this day because they are dynamic and have adapted to the times in order to do so. And to artificially suspend them in time, not only denies them their sense of vitality, but also their ability to survive outside of the subsidized museum environment. The Eco Museum becomes like an animal rescue center, great for awareness raising, but with the risk that the crafts won't be strong enough to be released back into the wild once tamed. So what is required? Perhaps nothing other than a fundamental reversal of the heritage paradigm, the authorized heritage discourse. This is the current situation with heritage commonly understood as the museum artifacts, the buildings and monuments, the stories around them and the infrastructure set up to promote them and arrest their decay. Intangible heritage is its supplement, supporting it by contextualizing and humanizing it to improve the visitor experience, but not essential to it. It's a nice to have add on. When we interrogate this paradigm, we begin to see that it is not sustainable as the inability to adequately support the intangible cultural heritage of traditional craftsmanship means that as the knowledge of how to make things is lost, objects and buildings hemorrhage meaning and become little more than relics, like those from civilizations lost to history, whose use and construction methods are little more than guesswork. By annexing ICH, the whole system degenerates. When we lose the skills to make something, we fetishize the object and prioritize its preservation above all else, its meaning ebbing away, a vessel for speculation and fantasy. Imagine a reversal of this paradigm in which the intangible is foremost, the safeguarding of our embodied knowledge, skills and practices. The tangible outputs of traditional craftsmanship are no longer fetishized, but instead are just physical manifestation of the skill, exemplifying and bearing witness to it, but in the knowledge that we will also always be able to make more and better as the craft evolves. We won't always be looking back and wondering at the unobtainable skills of past generations lost to humanity, but see that progression as part of a continuing evolution of skills we are a vital part of. So what might this mean for the museum? In the first instance, museums might become less repositories and more facilitators, not necessarily hosting craftspeople on site in an artificial environment that stifles the evolution of the craft, but within the communities in which these crafts have evolved. The museum instead becomes a bridge between the heritage that exists in the world and the general public wanting to learn about it. If it continues as a physical site, and it wouldn't have to in this paradigm, then the objects it holds become illustrations of how a craft has evolved through history in response to its social, cultural and technological circumstances and how it continues to evolve to this day. Craftspeople rarely want ongoing subsidy. They would much rather prefer to operate within the commercial environment that has driven their evolution. What they do need is a favorable operating environment and not one that is stacked against them as we see today. Rerouting heritage funding to the support of skills transmission for its intrinsic value, rather than to instrumentally preserve a material asset would be a huge part of this, as well as the possibility of the kind of tax breaks and other economic incentives seen in Japan's Living National Treasures Scheme. In Fernando Vidal and Nelia Diaz's work on endangerment, they identify anxiety of loss as one of the defining drivers of the heritage prof profession. By flipping the her hierarchy of intangible and tangible heritage, would that not go some way to alleviate that anxiety? If we knew that the skills to make human history's greatest treasures were still living and still nurtured, would that not give us the assurance to make a more subtle approach to tangible heritage convention in the face of heightened environmental and economic pressures, as suggested by Caitlin de Silvi in her book, Curated Decay? With less emphasis on preservation and more on be bearing witness to the passage of time, more re resource could be allocated to the skills that created these artifacts and buildings in the first place. The Museum of Making in Derby, while an urban museum, 
is beginning to point to a new way in stark contrast to the white glove curatorial approach of many museums a portion of their collection of historical tools and artifacts are available not just to be handled by the general public but to be used by makers as part of their open workshop policy of hosting makers on site not permanently or in any sort of contrived historical reconstruction but for practicing makers as a resource as and when they need it, supporting the organic continuation of the city's manufacturing heritage. We're working with them and a few weeks ago hosted two workshops for local schools with Rug Tufter Denzel Kari and Tapestry Weaver Abigail Wasty, alongside a seminar on the future of crafts in the hands of the next generation. And as, a, as an aside, rug tufting is a great example of a craft that has come off the red list in recent years as a result of young people like Denzel taking up the craft and sharing their creations on Instagram and TikTok. By heritage, we have always referred back to the root of this word in inheritance, a two-way relationship between past and future with neither more important than the other, but with the future so much more demanding of our attention and action as the only one we can influence for good. The future and the next generation occupy our thoughts and plans on a daily basis. We need to include the voices of those who have the biggest stake in it. The paradigm shift I've presented here is extreme, but it's perhaps what we need to be thinking about in order to realize a balanced outcome based on far greater parity between the tangible and intangible heritage. We will continue to campaign for UK ratification of the 2003 Convention and continue to do what we can to safeguard this living repository of embodied craft knowledge, give the next generation the best chance possible to deal with the social, economic and environmental challenges of the future. And that's it from me. Thank you, Daniel. That was an amazingly rich and, and thoughtful presentation and I think an awful lot for us to take away from uh, that and, and to think about. I, ha I have a, a few questions, but I think it might be wise for us to sort of segue straight into Greta's uh, presentation, and then we'll come back to questions at the end. So if everyone wants to mull over Daniel's presentation during Greta's and think about Greta's as well, and then please start popping some questions in the chat if they spring to mind, and we'll come to those uh, in, in due course. So. Greta, can I ask you to share and, and present now as well? Yeah, of course. Hopefully this will work. I'm a bit out of practice on Zoom and PowerPoint and that sort of thing. Um, right. Hopefully there we go. Um, uh, yeah, I can see your... Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So um, Ollie's given a little bit of background to me, and I should say that it was really... Um, a really good experience for a while when I was working at Merle and dealing very much in the tangible side of things and then also being a trustee of the Heritage Crafts Association and dealing very much with the intangible and the, the two roles kind of really complemented each other nicely and it was good to get involved in various projects which did attempt to integrate the two aspects a little bit more closely. Since 2017, I've been curator at the Craft Study Centre at the University for the Creative Arts in Farnham, and we hold internationally acclaimed collections of 20th and 21st century British ceramics, printed and woven textiles, calligraphy and lettering, and a small amount of furniture and wood alongside a large documentary archive. But kind of very sadly, despite being based at a university which runs craft courses, very little is made, use is made of our collections by either students or tutors. And sadly, we've also done very little to engage with the intangible heritage related to our collections. And that is something we would like to change. Um, even more sadly, some of these craft courses at UCA have recently closed and there's a kind of a big shift to focus pretty much entirely on digital rather than hand skills, which is feels like we're really moving away from the kind of core of the intangible heritage of craftsmanship that we want to be thinking about. Um, but just to give a little bit of background to my interest, because I think this kind of provides some explanation to the approach that I'm going to come at this from. As we know, there are many museums in the UK with significant craft collections, but 
our focus tends to lie in caring for those physical objects rather than in supporting the intangible skills associated with them. And when we as museums do think about intangible heritage, we tend to think about it in terms of improving at the understanding of our collections, the ways in which we interpret them, them and the stories we associate with them. So it's more about um, intangible heritage supporting the museum rather than the museum supporting intangible heritage. And so my particular interest has been in how museums can provide meaningful or long-term engagement with and support for craft skills and thus play um, an active role in supporting the transmission of the intangible heritage. So the kind of transmission of those skills to future generations as museums in other countries have um, perhaps been doing. So we can think about our museums as collections that people can use for study and research. And yes, we might have space for an exhibition or we might run some workshops or a taste today, but, but can we do more? Um, so today I just kind of want to talk about a few projects I've been involved in which pick up on some of those threads. But as I was putting this together, I realized that some of these date to quite a long time ago, but we'll blame COVID for kind of messing with time. Um, Daniel's already talked about the red list and the different iterations of that. And I think I'll just touch on the fact that he identified, um, you know, the challenges that are facing heritage crafts today, many of which are interconnected, but those things like training issues, recruitment, education, market issues, supplies of raw materials, small business issues, technology. And I do think that um, if we kind of think about that paradigm shift that Daniel was talking about, could any of these issues offer a potential avenue for museums to think about how they could support craft skills? So could museums maybe do anything that helps address some of those issues? Is there something around, um, you know, shared marketing or creating, creating a market for craft products? Or I don't know, I haven't really thought through those ideas, but I think it's just something that is worth touching about, touching on. Um, so, Anybody who has ever encountered me will know that I am completely and utterly obsessed with baskets. So I had to touch on um, this basketry project that we ran at Merle in about 2014 called Stakeholders. Um, and this project was all about encouraging knowledge and sh skill sharing between established and up and coming basket makers and between basket makers and the museum. So it addressed gaps in knowledge held by the museum about the collections, but it also addressed gaps in the collection itself. And we ran two study days with um, basket makers. So it was five established makers and five up and coming makers to analyze and describe baskets which hadn't been catalogued in any detail. Then all of that information was added to the database. But the great thing about this was that the, the basket makers were sharing their skills and knowledge with one another. Um, we also then commissioned the makers to create something that would be accessioned into the collection, whether it was an example of something that wasn't already in the collection, a replica of a particularly vulnerable basket, something that they were inspired to make by the collection, or just something that was representative of them as a maker. But I think one of the key things about this project is that those enhanced database entries, which are accessible via the online catalogue, have gone on to become a really, really key point of research um, and a starting point for many basket makers who want to research how to make a particular basket. Um, and I kind of, I really see that as a model that could be expanded to other crafts where both the museum and the craft community benefit. And this ties in with something called the Traditional Basketry Project, which the Basket Makers Association have been running for several years where the BA has been encouraging its members to visit museums and document the baskets in the collections. But the Basket Makers Association and Heritage Crafts are now working together on an endangered basketry project, which has come about as a result of the Red List, which draws on this, this um, traditional basketry project and other research to pull together all the um, skills and knowledge about baskets where the skills to make them are disappearing with the aim of creating a resource for makers 
um, so that these baskets are documented and that makers can um, pick up on making them and kind of make sure that those skills aren't lost. Another um, really, oh, sorry, so that's just the link to the Endangered Basketry Project. Um, they have a report there and then the, the kind of work moving forward on that now. Um, this is another quite old project dating several years called Harvesting the Knowledge, which was a happy museum project between Caridigian, Caridigian Museum and Tier Coed, um, which is a charity that connects people with land and woods by delivering outdoor training, learning and well-being programmes. And the museum had a really large collection of uh, items relating to local craft and industry, particularly um, wooden items, which they often struggled to interpret and to connect to the processes by which they were made and used. So again, there was a strand of the project which involved working um, with people with experience in greenwood crafts and woodland management to share the knowledge about the objects. But what I thought was a really, really interesting strand to this project was that they were promoting social enterprise through the traditional crafts. Um, they were creating a range of woodcraft products relating to the museum's collections to sell in the shop. And through this, they were hoping that they'd be able to kickstart the participants' self-employed careers and provide an outlet for their products. So that was just a kind of another way of thinking through it. Um, another project I was involved in was a heritage lottery funded project in the Lake District um, called Walter's Tools, which was undertaken by the New Woodmanship Trust. And this aimed to sort, catalogue and renovate a collection of heritage hand tools and to create a, a tool library for public use, which is now housed at Stop Park Bobbin Mill. And I really liked this project because it felt like it turned uh, things on its head. So instead of makers coming into the museum to um, share their expertise on you know, how to catalogue um, a collection of tools and tell us about the tools. I, representing the museum, went to share our expertise on how you go about creating that catalogue of tools, what things you wanted to document. Um, and then they put together a list and they refurbished the tools. But again, contrary to normal museum practice, where something enters the museum and then we can't really ever use it, um, the whole purpose of this project was to create a collection specifically intended to be used, so like a handling collection, but a using collection. And it might not be something that we want to do with our already um, accessioned historic collections, but I did really, really like that idea, especially, um, and particularly I found this a lot when I was at Merle, we often had to turn down people offering things to us, offering their tools because they want them to go to a good home. And it, it's fantastic if things can still be used. A more recent project from um, 2018, and you may have heard Ollie talk about this, is the Merle's Museum of the Intangible Project, which was all about thinking about how museums can move away from the traditional focus on the tangible towards a broader definition of heritage. Um, which incorporates the intangible, whether that's about just introducing the concept of ICH to audiences and considering what it means to them, whether it's about exploring some of the ICH connected with collections or helping safeguard particular practices. And as part of this project, we ran a series of workshops with creative practitioners, academics and other stakeholders to look at key collections and explore some of the ICH connected with them. We commissioned a series of creative responses based on those discussions, and we produced this toolkit to help other museums do something similar, with the idea that we'd hope uh, other museums would run their own Museum of the Intangible Projects, although I don't know, Ollie, if any ever have. But it's a really useful toolkit just to take a look at because it's got some information on why museums should engage with intangible heritage and how they might go about engaging with it with ICH, so whether that's working with communities, working with other organisations, through programming, phys providing physical space, collections management, documenting practices, or just uh, awareness raising. And then one final thing I wanted to mention was um, the Intangible Cultural Heritage and Museums Project, which was a four-year European project that concluded just before the first COVID lockdown. 
and it set out to explore the variety of approaches, interactions and practices relating to intangible heritage in museums in Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Italy and France. And it emphasised the role museums can play in safeguarding intangible heritage and how it can become um, an integral part of museum practice and policies. And they produced um, a book which you can uh, get hold of a copy. And related to this, I just happened to have an email yesterday um, from the International Committee for Documentation, which has an intangible heritage working group. And next month, they're running a session, um, an online session about how we can work towards a standard for um, capturing intangible heritage in our museum collections management system. So I'm hoping to take part in that. Um, and so the Craft Study Centre, we are a very, very small organisation. We have lots, you know, much, lots of limitations on our resources in terms of space, time, staff and money and it might just be that for us the only way we can really do anything to um kind of support intangible heritage is through the documentation we keep about our collections but it would be really great to have some kind of information um you know some guidance on how we might start thinking about that and then one final thing i did want to add was i had a, a newsletter recently that came out to say that HLF have now just published some guidance on intangible cultural heritage and to help you identify and describe ICH in your project and funding applications, which I think is quite a move forward for them because they were always very um, reluctant to accept um, the idea of intangible heritage. So that's it from me. That's brilliant, Greta. Thank you so much. And I think uh really useful to have a uh, sort of the, the broad conceptual overview and then some really interesting practical examples of of steps i think that we could all uh consider thinking about when it comes to maybe reversing that that heritage paradigm that daniel was uh talking so eloquently about um i had a couple of questions that i wanted to leap in with perhaps if anyone else has questions they could put them in the chat and i've also got a couple of questions that were uh, that were added to the Eventbrite bookings, which I will come to uh, in due course. But perhaps I could just kick off with a question for you, Daniel, which is about um, the economic aspects of this. You talked uh, about the Mapping Heritage Crafts project, and that's obviously going back quite a while now. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we've had some quite significant changes politically and economically since then, Brexit and, and uh, COVID and uh, some major economic downturn. Uh, and, and rising interest rates. I wonder whether you have any sense at the moment of of how makers and craftspeople are doing in the current economic climate and, and what, if anything, museums and heritage organisations might be able to do to, to help support and bolster them at this difficult time. So it's just anecdotal evidence at this point. We have tried to raise funding for a renewal of that research that took place in 2012 uh, to no avail, unfortunately. Uh, I think there might be more scope for doing it within Scotland, who have a much more progressive view of intangible cultural heritage. And there's some interesting research that's been done there recently, led by a consortium of organisations, including Museums Gallery Scotland and uh, Creative Scotland. So there's some hope there. Um, and so in terms of our sense of the economic situation, it's it's definitely got worse. I think the 2012 research uh, said that there was a potential for a 10% 10, 10 growth within the sector with government uh, investment, which never happened. So I think rather than uh, it staying stagnant, it's probably declined within that time. I know the Crafts Council have done some research showing an increase in the market for craft and their remit does overlap with ours substantially, but there is a significant difference in that they're focusing more on um, uh, contemporary crafts that you might see in an art gallery, whereas we're focused more on crafts that are more integrated into people's everyday lives and the vernacular. Um, particularly since COVID, we've seen a lot of craft businesses struggling. Uh, so with COVID itself, it was the reduction in face-to-face -face selling opportunities, which was quite div divisive in the sector in that 
a lot of the businesses that were heavily reliant on face-to-face -face selling really struggled. Those that had done well in setting up um, online routes to market, actually, a lot of them had a reasonably um, uh, good, if you can say that, co um, COVID pandemic in that it didn't affect them too badly. And then the knock-on effects of Brexit, which has its own issues about exporting goods and Im importing supplies. And uh, I don't think any of those implications were really thought of uh, in the run-up to the Brexit vote. Um, and we've all got our opinions on, on that. And then latterly, the, the energy crisis and the ongoing uh, financial situation, including um, uh, inflation getting out of control it's just all of these crises have had uh, cumulative effects over the last few years and the result being that we're talking to a lot of craft businesses now that are on the verge of collapse and um, whenever we lose a craft business we we always look at the broader um, ecosystem of crafts if you like a lot of these crafts particularly in and more industrial crafts in cities are interreliant with each other. There's supply chains happening within, within these areas. So you might have allied crafts in, um, in pottery in Stoke-on-Trent or in cutlery in Sheffield, where they're all reliant on each other. Luton in uh, hat making in Luton is a particular example we're we're thinking about at the moment because one of the hat block makers is really struggling. And if we lose that, it could mean that a lot of the hat makers will struggle to be able to get hat blocks um so yeah when we lose a business it's not just that business and all those jobs that we're losing it's the potential for it having a domino effect over the rest of the heritage craft sector so uh, for many it's looking really dire on the flip side in terms of the public appreciation of crafts we think that's on the rise so there's a reason for optimism there with all the tv programs uh, we um, announced in the summer that our new chair is Jay Blades, uh, co-chair uh, from the BBC Repair Shop. He's doing fantastic work in raising awareness of traditional crafts, creating a, a revitalised market for these crafts. Uh, and we're we're hoping that 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 knock-on effect will start to be seen, and we'll we'll start to see a pickup. So there's opposing factors, and it, we we don't know how it's going to pan out. But hopefully, we're on on the rest of a, a wave of uh, enthusiasm for craft that will see us through into the future. Yeah, and let's hope um, rural museums can coast through on the popularity of Jay Blades and uh, and the repair shop as well with the exciting featuring of the Wealdon Down. Um, picking up on what you said about um, the energy crisis, it might be a good point to ask the question that was posited on uh, on the Eventbrite. Um, which was about climate change, and someone asked how rapid, how is rapid climate change affecting craft working as ICH? So I don't know whether you could both uh, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I think it is having an effect in in multiple ways. So very immediately, and perhaps from a, a selfish perspective of the craft businesses, um, it's it's impacting on the availability of materials. So a lot of these uh, craft businesses are reliant on um, maybe um, exotic timbers grown in Africa or South America. Uh, whether they should be using those anyway for ethical considerations is, is another matter, but the supply of those materials is becoming more difficult as a result of climate change. Um, so that's it's causing rapid change anyway and accelerating that change. Um, energy costs. Um, with crafts like um, blacksmithing and um, uh, pottery and glass blowing that are very energy intensive. Obviously, they're struggling with their, their costs. Um, but on the other side of, of it, I think um, the, the potential for heritage crafts to be a, a partial solution to some of the issues posed by the uh, environmental collapse, um, I think there's there's lots of scope there. We think that the, the, the body of knowledge and skills and practices that we're calling intangible cultural heritage around traditional craftsmanship is a valuable toolkit for the next generation to deal with these environmental crises. Uh, we don't exactly know the shape of the situations that they're going to be facing, but um, presumably um, being able to make things is gonna be part of that solution. 
um, reducing economies down to a more manageable local economy where you're um, sourcing your materials more locally and you're you're selling more locally you're shortening that supply chain from producer to consumer we think those things are going to be part of the solution and it's going to be reliant on them having access to these skills that many of which are endangered now so that's a really important reason for us keeping them alive so they can make use of them but i think we should also say that one of the fundamental points about intangible heritage is that it's not immutable it it can change and it should change and one of the things about craft is that it has always developed in response to the environment in which it's found itself you know if we just use the example of baskets you, the reason we use particular materials is that those are the materials that were available in particular areas. And it might be that we have to stop using those materials, but we start using different ones as different ones become available. Um, so I think there is potential that that crafts will change with the changing climate, essentially, and that whilst we don't particularly want our environment to be truly destroyed, you know, this, this, that is how intangible heritage just does change and it should change. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting point, and particularly in relation to people who not only look after uh, heritage craft object collections, but also look after a great deal of agricultural material in relation to ICH uh, and, the, and the skills and practices around traditional agriculture in particular regions and landscapes of, for example, the UK those landscapes are changing and those environments are changing and the types of agricultural practice that can happen within those spaces will adapt and change over time. And I th I'm thinking particularly of the, the growth of, of uh, vineyards in the south of England, for example, or the introduction of particular crops and plants that otherwise wouldn't have grown 10, 15, 20 years ago, or certainly wouldn't have thrived. So I think we have to be mindful of that and the way that we collect and think about those things. It's also, it, it plays into some of these questions and challenges that, that you both hinted at, or Daniel talked explicitly about in, in relation to the heritage paradigm of, of tangible and intangible. Um, and the, facts that, the, the fact that the sort of material nature of things museums look after has that degree of fixity about it. Um, I worry here about, uh, and this is something that perhaps the wider audience aren't familiar with, often in intangible cultural heritage terms, people talk about ins inscription of intangible cultural heritage. So certain countries maintain listings of particular types of heritage seem to be under threat uh, the, and, and they inscribe them. Uh, and it's a sort of formal process. And it's a bit like cataloging an object, you know, once it's inscribed, it's inscribed and, and it feels a little bit fixed. And I wonder whether, before we turn to the, there's another question coming in, whether uh, you could both reflect on that, on that fixity of the way in which we record and think about things. I think that the red list is a good example of where you're revisiting that continually, um, but that's subject to continued funding. And I wonder whether there's a risk there that you, 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 build yourself into a position where things become more fixed over time because you talk about them repeatedly in terms of the same description, if that makes sense. I is think, that a risk? I think, I think that is a risk. I think you're right. Um, and uh, Greta made the important point that these practices do change over time and need to in order to, to remain vital and dynamic and, and stay alive. Um, after we published the first edition, we started to nuance our argument a bit around uh, the crafts that we considered uh, vital to continue. So we, we started to say that not every craft is going to survive and nor should it necessarily, because over the course of history, crafts have always died out and new ones have sprung up in a kind of organic manner. And uh, we shouldn't be there to necessarily ch change that dynamic. Um, we're more there as facilitators for a public discussion about the cultural value of crafts in general and for the for the public to decide whether uh, a craft um, element is important compared with the other more recognised areas of culture, like music and dance and uh, theatre, all those kind of things, uh, which historically they, they've been uh, poorly valued against. Um, I've forgotten the first part of the or the main part of the question there. <laughs> it was it was really about that that 
challenge of the process of inscribing and listing mm -hmm. things. And yeah, I think yeah. you've, you've, you've answered that, I think. Um, but I don't know enough about the, the mechanisms of the, the UNESCO inscription in terms of intangible cultural heritage, but perhaps there's, there's a, a mode for thinking about it in that we do in museums, we love documenting and cataloging, but we should also be aware that actually that documentation process is never complete and we should always be kind of reviewing and revisiting and maybe that is that that kind of you know needs to be bored in mind that just because you've kind of documented something doesn't mean it's that's fixed now you should be revisiting and thinking about it because our kind of interpretations of things change over time the the meaning the use the associations all change over time and might kind of want to you know, we, we should be bearing that in mind. Um, that's great, Greta, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm hopefully successfully asking Joanne Orr to unmute and, and share her questions and thoughts with us. Joanne, for those of you who don't know her, was until fairly recently, I think, um, a CEO of uh, Museums Gallery Scotland. So she might be a familiar face and name to, to some of you, but perhaps uh, Joanne, you could just give us a sense of what you're working on and and, and ask your questions. Yes, uh, thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me to the meeting today, very last minute. So um, very much appreciated uh, being able to, to, to add to the conversation. So I was CEO at Museums Gallery Scotland until 2018 and went through the accreditation process and a lot of the research responding to museums, um, mainly community rural museums, um, wanting more support on ICH in the UK. Um, and now I'm a facilitator as part of the global network of facilitators for the 2003 convention. And it was just to pick up on Greta's point about the listing mechanisms. Um, UNESCO is a large political organization and that does affect how effective it can be, but it is our kind of umbrella cultural organization. And only last week or last Thursday, the G20 had a whole day on living heritage and sustainable development. So it's in the international agenda in terms of ICH on a global level and the importance of ICH in, in all its domains to the future of the planet, basically, um, and a lot on climate change on that day. So it's becoming, people are more aware. I think a lot of it has been around finding it difficult to put in a lot of our, for instance, copyright, ICH, university, our, our structures and museums to translate it into essentially what are post-colonial colonial constructs and indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions. There is, you know, a lot of, a not exactly, a, it's difficult to fit. So I was really interested in the work on cataloging and changing those, um, looking at those mechanisms for our museum documentation and it's it's going to be a very long process I would say but there is some interesting work happening so at the moment I'm working on a book which is like an introduction to the whole lots of the areas around ICH so an introduction to the key questions around sustainable development conflict and emergency decolonization repatriation so it's a it's quite an umbrella one so there'll be lots of case studies and really some great work is going on so just in terms of the listing, it was very set. Um, there are three lists for this convention. It was very difficult to move between them. So they've just made that a lot more flexible. Um, so if you were on urgent safeguarding, you couldn't suddenly move to the representative list if you stopped being urgent safeguarding. So they are trying to, it's it constantly evolving. It's the living heritage entity now is the secretariat. So there is a real drive to try and keep that movement going. So UNESCO itself is realizing that. I think one of the key issues is the disembodiment between the different conventions. So the 1972 convention, the recommendations on museums, they just don't talk to each other. So you have very different, um, different interpretation of what culture and heritage is. So that can be a real, and I think in the international stage, which then boils you know, local, local to global, it's, it, it does impact how we're working in this field. Um, but one thing I would say, even though the UK has not ratified, the policy work, the energy that you put in, Daniel, in your organisation is really important in influencing the UNESCO policy side of things. So MGS's work did have a real impact at policy level for UNESCO because 
our energies weren't tied up with with putting applications and nominations in for the representative list so but it does mean you don't have a full seat at the table so i think that works so i was interested daniel your comment on the link with our colonial past if you've been seeing that now starting to uh to to show its face really yeah i can't point to any, any specific research and i think it will be very useful for that kind of research to be done but just from things I've picked up in conversations with people I get the sense that um, part of the attitude of the UK government in the past to ICH is that it's been it's been othered it's been it's been considered as something for countries that have lost elements of their tangible heritage is either as a result of conflict or displacement or through and possibly our intervention in in uh, colonial relationships um, and in quite a patronizing or condescending way thought of as something for them whereas we we've got our museum collections and I'm thinking uh, in terms of some of the the national institutions rather than rural museums which represent much more representative of what the working class culture so in a way I think it's been seen seen as other something that we don't need to get involved in but it's great for them to bring them into the heritage conversation um, I think there are parallels between that cultural, uh, that colonial dynamic and the class dynamic within the UK. And I think the cultural gatekeeping around museums is as other than the, the vernacular culture that we, we, in a way, represent the working class craftsmanship that's come up through both the rural practices and the industrial practices. And that's why they're not considered culture on the same scale as other elements of culture, theatre, opera, all of that, um, th those kinds of things. Um, so I think I think there are lots of historical power dynamics at play that we're still facing the consequences with today, even though we've moved on so much in our thinking. It's the it's the infrastructure that we're kind of dragging along behind us. Do you want to come back on any of that, Joanne, before we move on to some of the other questions? Um, no, useful. Just one other point, and it's because um, I totally agree with all that, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, um, just with for Greta as well. Thank you for sharing that uh, link, Greta. Was There is a new project for this year for the 20th anniversary of the convention, which I don't know if anybody's come across, Wiki Loves Living Heritage. So Wikipedia has really got stuck into living heritage Many years ago when I was at, at MGS, we had a wiki approach inventory and Wikipedia wanted to, to move into this area of getting all their Wikipedians to, to document ICH. And we were like, oh, it needs to come from the practitioner. You know, the inventories have to, to be from the bearers. But they, they're doing a mass campaign. And one of the meetings last week's on the ethics of sharing, which I think really relates very much to the cataloging and what is recorded, how it's shared, what's secret. And Wikipedia is really get engaging with this um, subject in a way I don't think it's done before. And it's a real intersection of different disciplines. So you can follow that on Wiki Loves Living Heritage. And I would encourage people to get involved um, with the campaign because I think there'll be quite a lot of new thinking with that, the tech world and culture and IP and copyright and how we actually treat data and share um, our knowledge and tradition bearers. So Wiki loves living heritage. I can put it in the chat if you want. That's brilliant. That's really interesting. I put I put a link to the, the campaign launch in there, but uh, there may be better links than that. So Joanna, uh, Joanna, if you know of any, do please share them. Um, there's a, there's a question in the chat. <laughs> brilliant. Um, there's a question in the chat for uh, Greta, from Heather Lane from the Museum of North Craven Life. Uh, Heather, I don't know whether you want to come on and ask your own question uh, or expand on this in, in any way. I can't, uh, I need to find you in order to unmute you. Uh, where are you? Uh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Finally got the technology to work. Um, yes, just really sort of follow up a little bit uh, on, on Greta's question. Uh, she knows of old that I'm, I'm fascinated by music document, documentation anyway and, and classification. Um, but uh, it's very interesting to me, how do we uh, sort of uh, decouple the idea of recording um, ICH from the idea of recording objects? Because the, the, the tendency has always been to 
use the object as a sort of carrier for, for the additional bits and pieces that you might want to add in. So you might add a video of somebody actually, um, you know, practicing their craft, but it's always going to be attached to uh, either one or, or a group of objects. And I think uh, it's quite interesting working with, with craftspeople in North Craven, trying to work out what it is they would like to capture and they don't see it as object based necessarily. They see it as activity based. And I'm not sure that museums yet have a really good way of documenting that. So I'm just really interested to know whether whether anything um, is is emerging and whether there are things that we need to do um, uh, rather more uh, tangibly with the Committee for Documentation to make sure that happens. Um, I don't really know very anything very kind of specific about it. These are these are just particular my thoughts, but I'll be very interested to find out from this international uh, committee on documentation because I think you're always going to have the challenge that when it comes to cataloging, cataloging and documenting, we want uh, we want a standardised approach and we want everything to be consistent, and that's perhaps not the best way. And maybe that's one of the the first steps that we need to take is that we need to think about abandoning some of that consistency and going a bit free range in our systems which is horrifying but maybe we have to do it I do think it is really really important to involve um, communities to involve practitioners um, if we go back to our stakeholders basketry project which was very much focused on from that kind of object perspective it was about asking basket makers what sort of information do you want to know about a basket? What is it useful for you to know so that if you wanted to recreate that basket or, um, you know, uh, research or whatever, what are the things that you want to know? Uh, even down to taking photographs, what's the most kind of useful photograph to take? And they said beginnings and endings. That's what we really want. To see. Um, I think there are perhaps, you know, we don't even need to be really, really radical. We can just kind of think about kind of, how we use our existing documentation systems. I think we we all have uh, whatever system you use, there are presumably mechanisms for grouping things. We might be linking objects into an exhibition or linking objects to a loan. So perhaps we just need to think about a, a starting point as having some sort of entry for a, an aspect of intangible heritage that we want to kind of focus on and then we link our objects to that and it's not that the focus is on those individual objects they're just a a way of evidencing that intangible heritage practice but I'll be really really interested to see um you know what what sort of things are coming out what are being recommended how how people want to move forward in this sphere that's really brilliant Greta and I think I think I'm right in thinking Heather you worked with Greta at the Scott Polar, is that right? That's right. Yes, yeah. I do. I knew I recognised your name from somewhere. Um, I'd, I'd maybe like to just quickly move on very quickly to uh, addressing another question that came up in the event, Bright, um, which was about uh, what place you see for digital tools integrating with cultural heritage to support these crafts. I think some of this has come through with the the question of documentation, but obviously um, digital tools are broader than that, and we. Greta mentioned uh, films and, uh, and and other forms and photography and other forms of documentation. Um, but I wonder whether Daniel and Greta, you might like to expand a little bit on that. What place has the digital uh, got in, in, in this sphere? Um, so we could think about it in terms of technology in general and what we what we said previously about the crafts need to adapt in order to survive and have always done so every stage in history. Crafts have taken advantage of the technology available to them to give them a competitive advantage in the market. And that's how crafts have evolved through these incremental changes. I think as long from a craft perspective as they're supplemental to the hand skill rather than replacing it, um, I think that's really important that we don't lose the ability to to, to make things with our hands and to have that knowledge of material properties and uh, techniques that will allow us to continue making the, the tools and machines of the future and not allow the machines to, to take over. Uh, it sounds a bit ap ap apocalyptic, um, but we need to retain that link to the, the foundations of the craft in order to um, maintain control over it. 
in terms of um, things like um, uh, social media to publicize our crafts, uh, we think that's really important. Um, all of the endangered crafts that ha have kind of turned around their um, their destiny um, and become more successful, they've had an open policy. So in their workshops, an open door policy of inviting people in, sharing their techniques and methods. And that's re been reflected on social media as well as they share their processes. People are always interested in finding out how things are made and having an insight into the life of the maker really creates that connection that's um, going to have uh, positive uh, implications in terms of sales and awareness raising and support and patronage. So we think all, all that's very important. And then latterly with uh, craftspeople like Denzel, who I featured in my presentation, The Rug Tufter, uh, we've done some work with him and other young makers and they consider themselves equally craftspeople and content creators. And that's been a little bit challenging for us in getting up to speed with that new generation, the gen generation Z and the generation alpha that's coming up now. Um, their approach to, to making and the digital world as having much more of a parity uh, in, in, in importance in what they do. So we're getting up to speed on that, but we think that's a, gonna be a really vital way of craftspeople monetizing um, their practice through uh, using content creation as a as an income tool to support their work, just as crafts people of previous generations have used teaching and um, writing to supplement their own incomes. I think we're all content creators now, aren't we? Um, Greta, I wonder whether you might like to reflect on that from from a from a sort of museum perspective on this. What 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 can we in in museums and obviously for this audience specifically, rural museums be doing in digital terms to to better support and 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 do that bolstering work for the wider craft and ICH community. Oh, I know I'm I'm terribly disconnected from the digital world. So I'm not sure that I have much to add from that. But I, I just think that there's like digital tools are a wonderful way of connecting people. Um, particularly with these crafts where there are a few practitioners, they're not necessarily those that exist, they're not necessarily in the same locations. And I think we can be making use of digital tools for connecting people, perhaps for, for some elements of training, for, for sharing particular skills. I, I think I know that there are various, uh, again, going back to basket makers who, who kind of train with somebody over Zoom intermittently and then get together more sporadically because they're so far far apart um yeah I'm afraid I don't really have very much more to add on on the digital tool I think uh, I think that idea of networking is really important and particularly as we're sitting here as part of the rural museums network it's a nice moment again to I'm, I'm all about advertising the network um to, to mention the chewing the cud sessions and we had a really brilliant one recently with uh, Bob Powell, who I think is in the audience, um, talking about horse colour making, uh, straw colour making for horses. Um, and that was an opportunity actually for us as curators to to come together and, and sort of collections managers to come together and actually mention and share items that perhaps not all, the, all of us were familiar with. So there were examples being sort of shared in the chat and, and shared on screen uh, in the context of a conversation from Bob's extraordinarily specialist knowledge about the history and heritage of some of those objects. Um, so I think even bringing some some examples in that he wasn't familiar with prior to that. And I think I even did my bit for the for Heritage Cross by sharing uh, the mention of straw colour making in in the in the the craft listings on the Heritage Crafts website. So that so that's great too. But I and wonder whether yeah. I was just going to say a few years ago, and I had wondered whether it was worth kind of thinking about establishing a, an SSN for museums with craft collections and bringing these things together a bit more, but I never really um, pursued that. But I, mean, I think it's a really interesting idea. I, my concern is that those collections are incredibly broad mm. and, and that actually the specialist knowledge is, is quite specific and the, and the two don't always fit together neatly. The Rural Museums Network seems to be one context where that works quite well. We've got a, a broad a broad church, but a but specialist within it. Um, I had a question about uh, of my own actually about uh, some of the comments that 
Daniel had about museums and, and how they were a little bit like uh, rare breed centres where rare breeds go to just sort of muddle on and die. Um, and I, I think my counterpoint to that is, is that whilst that's true for a, a huge amount of the material that museums end up housing and the way in which they treat that, that material in quite tangible ways, um, I think the counterpoint is the seed bank example, where where some things are they they go away and they're kept safe in a repository and then they reemerge. And I think some of Greta's examples of the way in which basket makers have worked, uh, and coming to us using digital tools as well, looking at the database, looking at photographs that Greta's overseen, having taken of our collections, looking at the kind of almost recipes of of basket making that were were produced as part of some of that stakeholders work and other projects these these collections become touchstones in wider wider practices around heritage uh being reimagined and remade uh even when some practices have have become extinct they're sort of re re enlivened again um so i think there is a counterpoint there and i think somewhere in the middle of all of that is the is the role of what museums can do as facilitators around some of these tangible things that we're responsible with, as well as becoming a bit better at coping with the, the intangible and documenting and, and sharing that too. Um, I did want to turn everyone's attention to the chat there again, because there's interesting material coming in from Imogen uh, about uh, some some contributions and work that, that, that she's been doing with Heritage Crafts around the, the Red List. I didn't know whether uh, either Imogen or Daniel might like to explain and share a little bit more about that because I think it's relevant and pertinent to some of the, the questions and issues we've been talking about. It would be great to bring Imogen into the conversation. She's been doing some amazing work around uh, Gypsy Romany Traveller, Showman and Boater Crafts as part of the new edition of the Red List, which is being published next month. Did you want to uh, say a little bit about that, Imogen? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, it's lovely to see you all. I can see some colleagues, Daniel, John, Joanne. Um, I think George, you might be in here somewhere. Um, yeah, it's been a wonderful um, sort of six months of being asked to um, use my position as a Gypsy Romany person and also as a crafts maker to bring some visibility from the community into such an important document as the red list and what that meant was how to approach my community to share their cultural heritage which is very precious to their identity and when i talk about the community of, of grt gypsy roman traveler and showman and voters we are all different ethnicities within the umbrella of grt so so that's sort of for ease of um identification really and my methodology was very clear because it comes from being culturally embedded is that I have to go and ask my community what they're happy to share, who wants to speak, who doesn't, and start from there. So I can't second guess anybody. I, I can assume and make assumptions, but that would be wrong in this context completely. So I went to the community directly and um, the survey is still open and it will stay open until the 30th of June. Um, but we've had enough feedback to contribute three entries to the red list. Um, sh showman, um, canal art and barge art, and um, Vardo and wagon building and that Vardo arts in general. So I feel like we're having an amazing moment of visibility um, as, as a really marginalised set of communities. So yeah, I'm really grateful um, to Heritage Crafts and also to, for, to um, Joanne for including me in her book. Um, so yeah, I think I think this idea of um, the conversations around intangible cultural heritage and how I think people struggle with it a little bit. And I know um, at the, the end of the Westing conference, I felt um, Jeffrey Crossick perhaps struggled with the idea quite significantly. And I, I really felt like the point is that people who are living in a cultural space, it's not intangible to us. It's very, it's very, meaningful and, and um, purposeful and, and yeah I think the issue is not that intangible cultural heritage isn't there it's just hard to communicate and that the only way to do that effectively is by building trust in relationships um, so that's that's sort of where I'm at with it all um, so yeah I feel like it's going to be a really exciting year um, 
for visibility for the GRTSB communities. That sounds really fascinating and really interesting piece of work. And I hope uh, that we can find a way to share that uh, around the, the wider rural museums network and, uh, and, and hopefully reach a few more people before the, the, the close of your survey as well. Um, we've done a we've done a, a, f a few pieces of work with GRT communities through the network and and certainly through the Merrill over recent years and hopefully we'll we'll be revisiting those so maybe Imogen you might come back and talk about this work when it draws to a close and share that either through a chewing the cud session or through one of these longer seminars um, that would be really great. Um, there don't appear to be many more questions in the chat unless I've missed some coming in, but if you do have any other thoughts or comments, do put them in there just before we draw to a close. And we're a little, we've got another 10 minutes or so before we're set to end. So um, I don't know whether there are any other issues that other people wanted to, to ask or pick up on uh, right now. But in the meantime, I might just ask one question about, um, uh, there's, there's been some uh, both through the work that Imogen was talking about um, just now, but also through some of what Joanne was talking about in relation to uh, inscription of, of and recording of indigenous cultural practices in other parts of the world, um, and also some of the, co the conversation we were having about uh, colonial legacies uh, and the overwriting of cultural practice. The, the question of copyright and, and uh, uh intellectual property and who owns this knowledge and how that cuts across the challenges of recording sharing talking about working with communities um these are obviously issues that are incredibly hot for uh for museum professionals around the tangible and around the uh the visual and some of the challenges of, of copyright and ip in those contexts um are there particular things that we should be thinking about in relation to that uh, in the way that we work with communities and with makers. Um, perhaps you could respond to that, Daniel, first, and then maybe Greta and Joanne, if you if you want to come in on that too, that'd be great. Yes, so I had an interesting meeting the other day with uh, Kate Mason, who's formerly of CEO of The Big Draw, but now she works for ACID, Anti-Copying in Design. And uh, she's also a, a strong advocate of heritage crafts. And we were talking about this issue of IP within heritage crafts and how it's much more complex than in other sectors, because uh, somebody working within a lineage of tradition, they don't own a design themselves as an individual. They share that ownership with the lineage before them. So it makes all the legal issues very complex when it comes to protecting designs. Having said that, there's still huge issues in terms of, of copying and, and, and the effect of um, people um, attributing designs to themselves when they've acquired them from other people unethically. Um, so um, Kate and I are hoping to uh, facilitate uh, an event on that at some point and have a bit of a discussion about the nuances and how we can come to some uh, practical solutions about protecting IP within the heritage craft sector. It, feel, it feels to me like something museums need to have a handle on, though, particularly if we're holding examples of work made within that those kind of lineages, um, because we perhaps need to feed that into some of our catalogues uh, in relation to, to to those kind of things. And Greta will be familiar with this, that the, you know, that the, 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 the generation upon generation of different makers represented within just even within the Merrill collection of particular forms of, of craft practice, um, as well as the people out there are still carrying on those practices today. So I guess this probably comes in in relation to some of the material you look after at the Craft Study Centre too, Greta, does it? Yes, definitely. We've got things that are very much um, kind of of a lineage and lots of kind of cross ideas. I know just, again, going back to the baskets, this is a conversation the basket makers have been having and about when they come up with a design, should they be putting like a standard copyright statement, how it's really important when you're developing ideas to have a ske dated sketchbooks, dated pictures to evidence so that you can prove that, that that is your thing. But I suppose that that does suck us very much back into the focusing on the tangible element of it, whereas the intangible heritage is about, um, is obviously about the intangible elements. But I think then if you look at the sort of UNESCO defini definitions, that's much more about it's a community practice. And if you're talking about 
one person then that's maybe something kind of quite different if it's somebody individual something so I think there are a lot of ideas there to do however with yes it you know community ownership and sharing that and acknowledging the correct communities and that sort of thing I don't think we've just got to grips with that um that idea of a community owning owning a design uh, because it comes up again and again in terms of cultural appropriation mm. but um, it's not just the design though because the design is is only one element of yes full heritage it's that skills it's the knowledge it's so many more I think the I going right back to Daniel's presentation when he said that perhaps um the of all the domains of ICH that craft is the hardest one for museums to kind of reflect on in terms of you can't just give a space for a performance they're perhaps also the one that is most relevant to the museum because the tangible and intangible elements are so closely entwined you're always using tools to make a project you know that they can't be separated out so yeah that's tough isn't it and yeah i'm um, both both daniel and joanne have put uh some toolkits and 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 links in the chat that connect to that question of of ip and uh, and community knowledge joanne i wonder whether you might pick up briefly on this before we probably come to what i think will probably be our last question um I, I've, I've looked at both those links just now very quickly and i think probably what i need as a museum professional is someone to look at them and turn them into something that i can i need another toolkit <laughs> a special um, one dedicated to me from my end of things because this is this is an awful lot to get my head around um but if if you could comment on some of where things are heading that would be really good. yeah on the sort of global level you've got unesco with its the 2003 convention and you've got wipo the world intellectual property organization which has been grappling with this um traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions and along with the world trade organization because it doesn't traditional knowledge um community based the knowledge around crafts all of it doesn't fit easily into existing intellectual property and copyright structures. They tend to be individually focused and time limited, which for transmission of knowledge generation to generation just doesn't really help. So the link I've put in is a toolkit that was done by um, from uh, the, the initiative came through India and a fantastic organization called Banglan Attack um, and their art for life model they've been working on for decades in Bengal largely where you have a lot of rural craft um, hubs have been set up and it, they've really developed a methodology but that website the toolkit is quite dense and it's quite extensive but it's pulled together all the kind of knowledge of lawyers and where we're at and what it boils down to is it's very hard to create one tool that everybody can use across the world so it's moving more to ethical approaches and ethical ways of working. Um, so the ethical principles of the convention. So on that toolkit, you'll see individual artists who are using social media. So a lot of case study of artists, crafts, a lot of it craft-based artists, all this music performance, and that goes to the comment in the chat, who are trying to safeguard their intellectual property through putting forward ethical principles for the use of their material. So they're sharing online, but they're putting a code of how they wish their material to be used and there are examples and templates on the toolkit of that code approach and I think that's sort of a shift in terms of the thinking the world trade organizations putting a lot in and the other area where we take a lot of inspiration from is the world of biodiversity so the conventions on biodiversity this mentioned the seed banks that some of the legislation and the international legal instruments around biodiversity are transferable to ICH. So there's a, there's a beginning to look at it. There's no hard and fast rule. It's constantly evolving, but that general shift to an ethical and principled approach and, and case law coming through for that principled approach, um, it's worth knowing your stuff. And it's worth having a look at that. As I say, it's quite dense, but there's, there's a whole handbook here, there's toolkits and the people involved are the top sort of knowledge in the world. And so there's some really good stuff in there. And just one other point, it was one for you, Daniel, I came across in Scotland, craft in Scotland doesn't do heritage crafts. It only does contemporary art. So I'm a little bit shocked at this disconnection between contemporary crafts and arts and 
heritage crafts maybe one we have a conversation at later date i just find it really confusing so yeah <laughs> that sounds like something that's 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 going to take another hour and a half i just want to very quickly pick up on the uh the 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 last question in the chat we've got about a minute left if probably under a minute i apologize if we're running over um cara i don't know whether you want to come on and and uh share your uh your question or whether you've gone i think no i'm just, i'm still here oh, but you I'm are here to, i might i don't want to take up you know it probably take longer than a minute but um i just was reflecting on uh some of the issues that i've seen within uh how museums and in ich work together and in particular i think daniel mentioned that um you know music is maybe different to craft because it's it can be written or it can be captured um, maybe you suggested in an easier way than craft. Um, I wouldn't agree. <laughs> and it, as a musician, just um, it's often, I think, a misconception. Um, and it's what I've seen happening where there's then a reliance on that written um, document, whether it's a recording or the uh, paper document. And there's almost this kind of professionalization of folk music that's happened recently. And it almost seems that's extending across other things that I've seen as well in terms of the craft world as well, where there's that reliance on that recorded material and you've got that loss of the intergenerational learning and tradition bearers and all of the community based aspect of it. And I did want to just ask, how were the red list crafts selected? Because I guess this feeds into that age old thing of, say, women's crafts and the things that aren't about profit that traditionally weren't about the economic crafts um but the ones that were just done in the community and in the home and um i've certainly noticed certain domestic crafts traditional domestic crafts that don't seem to be on the red list but that i know either no longer exist or are on the very edge of disappearing so it's, i was interested in how those were selected but thank you, you so much for all of the conversations <laughs> you give us 30 seconds on that and then I think we better end Daniel. okay um so in terms of uh craft skill we we support skill wherever it resides whether that's in in commerce or in um amateur or in domestic settings um many crafts there isn't a, a market for them like lace making or model engineering but we still support them equally um within within their own environments uh, if there are any crafts that you think should be on the red list then do let us know we in terms of uh looking back through history we only include crafts as extinct if they've died out within the last 10 to 15 years just because otherwise we'd be looking back through history at all the crafts that have ever existed and it would become unmanageable but if there are any either on the brink or recently um become extinct do let us know because we'd love to feature them that's that's really great um so th thank thank you so much for that car and that was a nice note to end on it feels a little bit like collectors are to blame again the the folk revival across uh, the you know the early 20th century in relation to folk music and craft um being selective and highly problematic in the way that it did things um but a really nice uh, note and reflection to end on so just so just before we end uh, a big thank you to everyone for joining us today a final reminder that we've got another seminar coming up soon so that's thursday the 4th 2 p.m karen sayer and emily goff uh, and that's how can rural museums better represent deaf disabled and neurodivergent people we've also got next week's during the cud session uh, so that's over to network members another nudge for you all to join uh, we'll have more of these seminars in the autumn as well um, so if you're not a member and thinking of joining do check out the website for uh, more info on those benefits and how to join um, and and just a final particular thanks to to Greta and to Daniel for giving up their valuable time and sharing their amazing expertise um, and everyone for their their comments and discussion uh, and involvement in in today's seminar. So goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone.